Dzień dobry Państwu, witam Państwa bardzo serdecznie. Hello, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to our debate on behalf of the Warsaw Office of ECFR, Battery Foundation and Counterpoint. Today we have a debate about the European Green Deal. It is not the first debate on this topic. So together with the Battery Foundation, we've been discussing this topic for a while and we've been discussing different papers and different endeavors that we've been both involved in. And we've both published very interesting reports um, on the European Green Deal, but it's actually not the main reason why we are meeting today to discuss the future of the European Green Deal in political terms, in social terms, because it is indeed a very ambitious project of the European Union and it will have significant social and political consequences. And the issue seems to be quite simple. We already know that the implementation of the European Green Deal is one of the largest projects of the European Union since the establishment of the single market. And this project is going to change our economy, but it is also going to change the capitalism as such and the functioning of our societies and our political life. And I think that in many countries in the European Union, we agree that it is a very important project in fundamental terms. So when we think about the mankind facing the climate challenge, however, we do see more and more often that the implementation of this project is going to create new tensions and new divisions on the political scene in the European Union. And we will face many challenges and our societies will be affected by those challenges and by those changes which are going to take place. So we would like to discuss these topics today. We have extinguished um, guests. Let me mention Edvid Bending and Catherine Fieschi for now, because these two people are co-organizing co the debate today. Edwin Bendik, who is the head of the Batory Foundation, and Catherine Fieschi is director of the think tank Counterpoint. And I'm going to introduce the other guests soon. However, let me give you a brief description of the debate. So we, it's going to have two parts. The first part, the first part will focus on Poland, and we will be discussing the European green deal and how it is going to affect Poland and whether this is going to be a green wedge as it was expressed in the report published by um, counterpoint so whether there are going to be new divisions in our societies and there are going to be and we are going to talk about the political consequences of that project in Poland. We are going to discuss what kind of challenges we are going to face, also in terms of the energy transformation, and also whether this green wedge is going to strengthen the anti-European tendencies in Poland. And this will be followed by the second part of the debate, and our foreign guests will discuss with us the European dimension of this project. We will discuss whether Poland is an exception in this area or maybe not, whether other countries are going to follow 
uh, the example which is now being set by Poland. And we are going to talk about how this political turmoil around the Green Deal affects the debate on all the different policies with regard to the implementation of the European Green Deal at the EU level. So that's the plan for the two hours. And let me introduce the other two guests participating in the first part of our debate. So we have Edwin Benten, who's already been mentioned, but we also have Joanna Machkovac Pandera, president of the think tank called Forum Energy, Energy Forum. And it is a think tank that deals with the energy um, transition. And tomorrow there's going to be a very interesting um, conference on this topic organized by a Forum Energy. So I think I can invite you to this conference taking place tomorrow. And we also have Filip Pazderski, who is an analyst of the Institute of Public Affairs, a very well-known organization in, in Poland that deals with public surveys, not only this, but also with public surveys. And this organization has also published a very interesting report recently, and we're going to refer to it soon. And now voice over to Edwin Bending, president of, of the board of uh, Stefan Batoria Foundation. And the foundation has published a very interesting report this year on the so-called eco-Poland. So all this ecological transition in Poland. So Edwin, could you please describe what kind of challenges Poland is facing right now? Could you give us a helicopter view on where we stand right now as Poland and what kind of problems Poland has with the implementation of the European Green Deal, if there are any, and how would you describe all these issues we are dealing with in Poland with regard to the European Green Deal? Thank you. I'd like to thank you, Piotr, and I'd like to thank you, ECFR, and I'd like to thank Catherine, uh, of Counterpoint for co-organizing this event with us. And I would like to thank Catherine for inspiring us uh, by coining this new term, the green wedge. It is a very interesting report that shows some very interesting dimensions of, of this project. And all people who care about the climate change who are worried that we are not doing enough to fight the climate change. And it's especially the, the young people who cannot really read this problem in political terms. And it is a good way of showing how we can motivate those people who are actually responsible of, of, for managing the problem to do more. And we can also understand how to address people who are actually exploiting this problem. And let me give you some brief information on the global dimension of this problem. It not, it's not just combating the, the climate um, crisis, it is more. So probably we are going to have an economic slowdown and it is here to stay because it is a structural slowdown. So whatever we do, we are going to face this problem and we will have a phase of secular stagnation. Why we are going to have this problem? Well, there are many papers on this and there was an article in Nature, it was published two weeks ago and there is a summary of, of all different papers on this issue there. And the authors, the authors pose a general question uh, and they ask what the consequences are going to be um, in political terms and what the consequences are going to be for the welfare state, because this economic development has brought us peace and welfare 
in industrialized countries. And the question now is whether we are going to be able to keep this when uh, we are incurring more and more debts and the society is becoming uh, older and older, irrespective of how we manage the climate crisis as such. So this is really important because we are facing now a, a, a debate um, among economic scholars. So there are different theories about economic growth, green growth, the so-called post-growth theories. So the economists have different ideas, but irrespective of all these ideas, we need to answer the, the, this question regarding the democratic legitimacy of our institutions and how all these changes are going to affect our societies. And now, when it comes to Poland, in Poland, this debate is taking place too. And let me give you one specific example. There is one argument in favor of the green transition. It is the vision of green jobs. This argument has been discussed a lot uh, in, in Germany. So German politicians would explain to the society that they would get green jobs and that there would be more green jobs than um, the number of brown jobs we are going to lose uh, because we are going to give up coal. But this is not so easy. So there was no rapid economic growth to allow for there to be more green um, jobs as compared to the number of brown jobs that have been lost. So a promise was made and it was not kept. And it is, of course, a credibility issue. And the same argument is going to be brought up in Poland right now. Actually, it is already being brought up a lot. And the Polish miners um, can hear, for example, that they should not be worried that they are going to lose their jobs because these uh, are going to be replaced by new green jobs. But this is not necessarily the case, especially uh, if we are talking about uh, a country on the periphery. So all these neutral technologies of energy production, we are not going to be in charge of the supply chain. We are going to be subcontractors and it is a major change because we don't like coal, of course, but the coal has been the basis for our energy sovereignty, but also it has been the basis of our technological sovereignty when it comes to energy production. It was also something that Poland exported. So we were in charge of the supply chain because we were exporting coal. And now this is going to be lost. So the populists are going to refer to this a lot and they are actually talking about this already now. Let me mention Zbigniew Ziobro and his political party, um, which is a coalition partner of the law and justice uh, party. Um, they are already saying this, that we are going to lose this kind of sovereignty. So this shows what a challenge this is. And the report published by CounterPoint shows that there are two vacuums that can be used by the politicians um, now, especially the populace. So the first deficiency, the first gap uh, if you will, um, is the missing knowledge. So when we talk to people about climate change, well, we can already see that there has been a shift and people have already got interested in the climate issue. However, even one year ago, people were not really able to explain what the Green Deal was. Only 10% of Polish people were able to explain one year ago what the Green Deal was, what the European Green Deal was. So indeed, it is um, 
a, a gap. It is a vacuum because they don't have that knowledge and you can fill it with anything you like. So people will say, for example, that the energy prices are going to uh, soar up. So we can use any slogans you want. And you can help to get them across to the people. And this is being um, well exploited by the populace. And there's another analysis, which I like a lot. It regards the European Green Deal, and it shows uh, that it is a very closed topic. It is not open, even um, within the European Commission. So the different um, the different uh, members of the European Commission actually uh, operate within their individual bubbles, and they don't even know what the colleagues are doing. And this also can be exploited by the populists. So it is also a serious um, risk we need to consider. And we've already organized a, a few debates on, on this issue as Stefan Batore Foundation, and they have shown different risks and different opportunities. And I'm going to conclude soon so that the other speakers can take the floor at all too. So first we can see something which is kind of unexpected. So some unexpected social reactions. Shemiswav Sadura did some research which demonstrated demonstrated um, the impact on the pandemic on how people uh, are going to approach uh, the European Green Deal and the green transition and its implementation. And the young people that we actually hope will understand the problem better and will be in favor of the green transition, they are not going to be ready to give up even more to implement the green transition and to save the climate because they are so tired of the pandemic and all the restrictions they have to they have had to endure and and actually we have some shocking uh, results that young people are even less aware of the climate challenge um, than their grandparents. And another, some other research um, shows the following. There are people who are very much in favor of the green transition in their rhetorics. However, when it comes to individual choices, to making individual choices um, that are related to the lifestyle, it turns out that these people are not willing to give up the holidays on Spitsbergen, for example, or the flights to Florida or eating beef, for example. So this is a challenge too. They are happy to, well, those who live in the province, they are happy to give up such lifestyles because they don't usually uh, enjoy it. So it's not a big problem for them to give it up. So there is a huge gap between what people declare and what they are really prepared to do. And this is overlapped by the risk of uh, accusing each other because of misunderstandings and, and not in general in terms of climate, but also when we talk of air pollution, then um, inhabitants of uh, cities tend to accuse uh, people living outside uh, large cities of uh, incinerating uh, trash in the uh, Eden heating systems. Uh, and we, on the other hand, are so environmentally friendly because uh, we have gas heating uh, without even noticing that they drive a large SUV. Um, the, there is a barrier in communication. Uh, uh, the uh, Jagiellonian Club, a conservative uh, think tank, notices a lot of ecological potential in the Polish provincial areas and among uh, poor inhabitants of the city. Uh, but there is no communication. I'm just signaling uh, a problem that exists. Maybe we will have a chance to talk about it some more later. Uh, when we had a debate with representatives of the Aglonian Club and Kritika Politischna, when we discussed uh, Sadura's study, there was another unexpected 
unexpected uh, bit of information um, which consisted in essentialization so to say of certain problems so the head of the Aguilonian uh, club mentioned that we like to quote Pope Franciscus so the left uh, like him as well and we forget that what the Pope is saying is a package of many different things he says you cannot fight uh, for climate if there is no social justice or in other words your our fight for climate will not be effective if we don't fight to protect life which means if we don't ban abortion so in Poland, this combination in certain circles, so, so this combination of environmental efforts uh, with anti-abortion movements may lead uh, to a very dangerous mix of um, different, uh, different elements, which might prove attractive uh, to a large part of the population. Uh, so maybe to conclude, let me just emphasize that there is a number of different traps and uh, they are already being exploited and maybe will be exploited even more when we think about some upcoming crisis, for example, around the uh, tour of open pit mine and uh, the greatest misfortune would be if the green transition discourse would translate into something else and launch and reactivate the post-1989 trauma, which is still very alive among many people who lost their jobs, who struggled, uh, who were poor and only recently uh, were able to do some progress economically. So this is something we have to take into account as well. I realize that I haven't exhausted the entire catalog of problems related to that question. I just wanted to say that from the macro level, which binds us together globally, when we go down to lower levels, we see a cascade of problems that really uh, make us walk on a very thin ice. Uh, a very positive sign, however, uh, it may change uh, in the future, but now it is positive. We had a debate with politicians and we were able to invite representatives of all main political parties in Poland, including the ruling parties. And it was different than what we see in the US. They all spoke in one voice. Nobody challenged the necessity of a green transition. And everybody agreed uh, as uh, for the diagnosis. Of course, then there were some differences in terms of possible solutions, uh, but nobody challenged uh, that we need a green a transition in this group. Whether this consensus is durable, it's hard to tell, but as a starting point, it is a positive sign. Thank you very much, Edwin. Uh, it's been very interesting, uh, especially how you showed a number of traps of green transition, as uh, you referred to them. And these traps are linked to a very complicated nature of this process. Now I would like uh, to ask uh, uh, Joanna Maczkowiak pandera to present her perspective. Your perspective is slightly different because you yourself are involved in transition. So not only do you analyze uh, its uh, political and social uh, consequences, but you analyze the transition itself, you ask how it should progress, in which time, etc. Um, Forum Energy that you lead is very much involved in the question of just transition. You advise municipalities and regions uh, which will probably have to undergo the transition in a very dramatic way. And a word that is used uh, very often in this debate uh, uh, has to do with Pope Francis. Again, uh, Pope Francis say, says that we can't have an energy transition without uh, uh, committing to the pro-life, uh, but uh, it seems that 
and even more important link is the one between green transition and justice or just and fair nature of the transition. And my question to your Anna is, so which areas of the just of transition do you identify as the most important ones? In which areas uh, do we need a political response uh, in a sense uh, that we need to make sure we avoid not only the traps mentioned by Edwin, but also those trap traps that may stem from social resistance against uh, these changes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Piotr, and uh, good afternoon. I wanted to, to say hello and thank you uh, for the invitation. It is true that tomorrow we are going to have that conference and I'm uh, quite busy preparing it. Uh, and I wanted to mention it as well, because through this conference, we want to respond respond to a sense of hopelessness, a sense of doom, a belief that there are no solutions, that a blackout is unavoidable. Uh, I work in a field of energy and uh, many people working in this sector have this sense of uh, threat uh, without uh, really going deeper into the subject. So during tomorrow's conference, we want to offer 10 steps uh, um, towards overcoming the energy crisis because uh, the main risk we are facing right now is a certain uh, defetism and also um, a fear of polarization. I'm not sure uh, if we are talking about a real threat or about fear only because right now nobody is taking any steps uh, or uh, towards making energy more expensive. It is about promoting clean solutions. Nobody wants to restrict mobility. Nobody wants uh, to reduce uh, um, the comfort of in our life. And it would wor won't work if all we do is restrictions, restrictions, restrictions. We cannot go back to the caves or, or put on workers. No, uh, we need a wider transformation. And the idea behind green energy is that we try to promote and support clean energy sources. Uh, and obviously, right now, the cost of fossil fuels will have to increase. And we uh, so for for a time, indeed, the cost of energy will grow, but the point is to push fossil energy sources out of the market. Air pollution is really extremely high in Poland uh, these days, but we are all already paying these costs. Uh, 140 million zloty, this is the cost of air pollution in our country every year, and we pay with the health of our kids and with our health. So it's not true that uh, these costs are a song of the future. We are paying the costs already. And uh, we have already reached a place where we understand that climate is important, but we do nothing in order to implement some solutions. Of course, we are ready to accept money to adopt certain objectives, but institutions that are responsible, the Ministry of Climate or the Energy Regulation Office are too weak. They cre we create an institution for family planning and we don't have an institution, an institute for energy transition. We make people fearful because we, try, uh, we tell them that uh, this transition will cost us a uh, trillion zloty, but don't mention the money that is being spent right now. And uh, sometimes it is spent for the wrong energy sources, not the ones we want to support. So in the end, we will spend that trillion uh, zloty. The point is to spend it on the right things in the right places. So I think what we need to do is uh, to inform, to promote knowledge, to disseminate knowledge, and that will encourage people. It is not the point that we prevent people from moving around, from traveling. Um, it is 
about making them choose trains or electric vehicles. It is about convincing them uh, to use uh, eco-friendly energy sources for heating purposes, for example. I think this is task number one for us now. As regards the European Green Deal, it is actually good that we use um, it's actually funny that this government is introducing uh, the Polish deal right now. The same word is being used, deal, and people are confused. Uh, and it is uh, at least to confusion. One of the ministers uh, said recently that we can uh, block the European Green Deal, which is not true because it is not a single regulation, it's a whole package. And some of them are extremely important for Poland. The greatest barrier we are facing is a fear of change. This is swelling a popular um, populist messaging and no planning and uh, also no oversight and uh, we don't have an overview we don't know which elements are most important now to mention just transition that was uh, mentioned before it's really striking that after the experience of the 90s which is tied to a strong trauma i agree but uh bearing these experiences in mind it is strange that we are afraid of the same experience repeating we have money there is a, there are funds tied uh, to the european green deal and yet the regions are hardly prepared uh, um, to work and prepare plans and in many cases it is not clear whether or not they will be able to use the available funds we don't have good projects uh, and we don't have good projects we because we don't have institutions uh, that would be able to prepare plans we don't have specific goals that would serve as a motivation for individual reasons uh, regions just transition is not just about supporting minors. In my view, we have to talk about intergenerational justice, about the youth climate strike as well. Uh, the youth demand, uh, demands a clean planet. Our perspective is different than that of our children. Our children say that they are not interested in living on, a, on an earth uh, that is uh, burned down and unlivable. So of course, just transition is about leaving no one behind. We don't want uh, uh, to leave people behind. We don't uh, want to see any people not able to afford heating or power. This is just transition. The social agreement signed by the government and the miners should not be just a deal signed between one, one minister and um, several workers in the labor unions. We need a broader debate with many stakeholders, different institutions, experts, but also representatives of young people. This is how it is done in other countries that achieve a consensus. The industry as well. Industry is suffering because of the ever-growing energy costs. In summary, what is still missing is a step And I hope that you've had enough patience to wait in front of your uh, screens and that you are going to stay until the end of our debate. So our discussion was interrupted when Joanna Pandera Machkovic was taking the floor and she was speaking about different problems and challenges associated with the energy transition and the green transition when it comes to Poland and the Polish society. She was also talking about the issue of the just transition, and we're going to um, discuss these issues again soon. But now voice over to Filip uh, Pazderski, head of the Democracy and Civil Society Program at the Institute of Public uh, Affairs. And the Institute has done some research on how Polish people um, approach the activities of the European Union. And Philip, could you please explain how these challenges regarding the green transition could actually 
fuel anti-European positions within the Polish um, society. Edwin Bendek was referring to the political party Solidarna Polska being an anti-European party and criticizing the European Union in the context of the green transition. And I would like you to tell us if there is any research that actually confirms that this green transition could actually fuel anti-European positions within the Polish society. So is the Polish society going to be even more divided given this implementation phase of the green transition? Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, maybe, at least in Poland. And I will answer your question very soon. But before I do so, I would like to stress that I agree with what has been said before and got said that we had a technical problem, but actually it was just a coffee break. You know, we wanted to have it. It was according to our plan. So. Yes, we've done some important research and there are very important issues that need to be discussed when we want to talk about the green transition. And it is actually a, a problem of taking um, away the fear that people have right now because they do not have the knowledge they, they need to understand what is going on. And our research shows that and there are different groups within the Polish society, and some of them we could believe should be closer to the environment, like the farmers, for example, or people who live in the countryside. So we've done research on those people specifically too. And even though they are quite close to the environment because they live in the countryside, they do not know much about the green transition. And that lack of knowledge can be exploited by the populists. So what we need to do, well, we need to provide them with that knowledge. Otherwise, um, they might be uh, abused by the populists. And some years ago, we did some other research on the values of an open society. I do not want to refer to it in detail. However, it shows quite well that people's beliefs and positions are often very mixed and very complicated. So that research focused on the notion of an open society and you could refer to values such as the rule of law, but also economic security um, or social security or social coherence. And we asked people what their preferences were and it was the same people who said that they were for the open society, but at the same time, they made different choices that are actually not in line with um, this idea of an open society, because nevertheless, they are afraid of different changes that might take place, and they are afraid of the world uh, around them changing significantly. They are afraid of what they do not know. And actually, it is the same. Um, well, it is also the case now when we are talking about the green transition. And we also have young people who have been covered by this research. And we've asked young people how they see the democracy, but we also ask them what they prefer, democracy or some other values. And it turns out that there are many people, young people in Poland who say that democracy is good, it's okay, but only as long as we are successful in economic terms. Uh, so it's some 40%, so it's a lot. So there are a lot of young people who are willing to give up the freedoms, the uh, civil freedoms, um, when uh, by doing so, they can be more successful economically. 
So this actually shows what's important for young people in, in, in Poland. When their lifestyle is threatened and the green transition could actually lead to these lifestyles changing. So we might be, well, young people might be forced to give up, at least in part, the quality of life they've got used to. And it could be an argument for young people uh, in favor of actually disagreeing with with this project of, of the green transition, even though young people in general are actually quite supportive when it comes to green topics. So they are very much in, in, in favor of uh, combating the climate change. They are worried when it comes to the climate crisis. However, some of those young people might actually say that the lifestyle is more important to them when we really go into detail. So yes, they are in favor of the green transition, however, not at the expense of the quality of life, of their lifestyle. And they might actually say no at the end of the day. And this, again, could be exploited politically because you can always um, use people's fear when you're a politician. And this applies also to people who live in the countryside, even to women who live in the countryside. So there's been a very specific research project targeting women living in the countryside. I'm not going to go into details, but this research conducted by Professor Sadura actually shows that people are willing to change their behavior, but only when it comes to some simple choices. So they are willing to use less um, plastic, for example, or they are um, willing to um, manage the waste, for example, to sort the waste. However, not much more. And women who live in the countryside are actually even less willing to change um, their behavior. And it is also a social group uh, of people who do not know much um, about the green transition, even though these are people who live in the countryside. So they should be able to see that the climate is changing in their everyday life. Like they should be able to see that they have less and less water, for example, in the countryside. So again, there is room here for discussing politics and also for discussing where Poland stands within the European Union. And two weeks ago, we published the results of yet another research uh, project. And it shows that some over 80% of Polish people are in favor of the Polish membership of the European Union and just 5% are against against it. However, if we ask specific questions, which are being brought up in the public debate here in Poland, it turns out that they might see some areas of the European Union in a very negative sense. And this is being reinforced by many politicians and by many commentators. And just to give you one example, uh, people often say that the Polish farmers re receive less money as compared to French farmers, for example, or just farmers in, in, in the other European Union uh, member states, so that it is harder for them to compete. So this is just one example of how the European Union is often seen negatively by the Polish society, even though in general over 80% of Polish people are in favor of our membership of the European Union. So actually, it is a number of arguments being brought up in the Polish public debate against the European Union, and they polarize a lot. They polarize the society. So it is really crucial whether you're talking to someone who has voted for the ruling party, law and justice, or whether you're talking to someone who has voted for 
the opposition because we have huge polarization in the Polish society. And another issue that polarizes the Polish society in political terms is the topic of how we are going to produce our energy in the European Union. People are afraid that giving up coal might lead to a serious economic crisis in Poland. So that polarizes a lot too, because people are afraid that we are going to do poorly in economic terms when we are no longer allowed to produce our energy from coal. So this might influence the approach of, of many people towards um, the green transition. And this also um, influences this readiness, this willingness to change one's behavior. And there are many people who can still remember the crisis of the early 90s when we had this economic transition uh, and many people lost their jobs and they experienced economic hardship and people who live in um, towns like Bohatov. Bohatov is, is, is a town with a huge um, um, mine. And if that mine should close down, well, what are these people going to do? They are afraid of what's going to happen to this town because the whole economy of that town is actually based on that one mine. So we need to think a lot about how we can address these fears of those people. So that's it for now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Filip Pazderski, for, for your uh, um, comments and, and for your analysis of, uh, of the Polish public opinion's views on, on the climate transformation in Poland. Uh, now I um, I would like to uh, open the second part of our uh, of our event, <laughs> which uh, and welcome uh, our three other speakers. Uh, I've already mentioned Catherine Fieski, uh, director of Counterpoint, our partner. Uh, with us is also Susie Dennison, who's uh, the director of the European Power Program at the European Council of Foreign Relations, and last but not least Thomas Jungwirth, um, who is. Um, research uh, fellow um, at the Association for um, International Relations, AMO, um, a renowned um, Czech uh, think tank uh, in Prague. And you would like to put uh, this Polish case study of the Green Wedge or of the climate transformation into larger uh, European context. And I think uh, the best way to do that would be to start with, with, with some questions to Catherine Fieski, who, as I mentioned before, um, authored or co-authored report um, on the Green Wedge, um, which basically gave the inspiration for, for today's um, uh, debate. And, um, and this report um, analyzes in a very interesting way especially social media um, uh, debates on, uh, on climate change and green transformation in a number of European countries. So Catherine is, is really best suited to, to give us kind of a bird uh, perspective on, uh, on a bird view perspective on the, on, the, um, um, on the climate transformation debate across Europe. So I might, my very basic, very simple question uh, for you would be to what extent is Poland an exceptional case? You have heard the, for an hour the, the, the discussion about how things look like um, from the Polish perspective and to what extent is this an, an exceptional case? To what extent uh, um, is Poland just one of, of many uh, facets of, of these uh, very uh, colorful a discussion um, in in Europe. Mm, uh, so, what is what is your uh, your take on that? Great, thank you. Um, thanks very much, Piotr. Thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us today for for this discussion. Um, I think to tell you a little bit about where Poland is exceptional uh, and where Poland is more of a textbook case 
uh, it's uh, it's important to, to say a little bit about what we found in, in the Green Wedge uh, research. <clears throat> so we started to do this research because um, we had this hunch that despite the fact that, um, especially during the pandemic, uh, there was an argument that everyone now was in favor of climate policy, that everyone was worried about climate, that climate was everybody's number one preoccupation. We had this sense that potentially this consensus was a little more fragile or a little more limited uh, than, than we than was given the, the input and the impression that was given, sorry. And um, we have been working on populist parties and populist mobilization for 10 years and for my part for you know a lot longer than that, unfortunately. Um, and we had this, this sense and that um, climate could well be the next issue that populist parties might seize upon um, much as they had seized upon migration and immigration, and that they would transform it into what we called a wedge issue. And why we called it a wedge issue is because it has the capacity to split even the progressive camp, right? So the progressive camp in the end um, uh, split over migration and immigration because you could, you could argue with the right uh, you know, that this was problematic in cultural terms and in integration terms, in social terms, etc. But you could also argue, as some people did on the left, that it undermined wages, for example, right? That this was a vast conspiracy uh, by an elite to keep wages down, to basically uh, keep capitalism going, you know, at, at any cost. And we, we felt that, you know, there was the potential for climate to be used in exactly the same way, that it would be essentially depicted as, a, as an elite project, as a technocratic project, and more to the point, as a project that would, um, that would create uh, the, the, the heaviest costs and the heaviest burden on ordinary people who couldn't afford it, right? So, you know, a lot of parallels with the migration issue. What we decided to do, therefore, was to see a little bit how the conversation was playing out in eight European countries. And since then, we've added the UK and we've added the United States. And I just want to say quickly on this that I think it's, you know, it's important to note that, um, that uh, you know, two quick things. One is that, you know, the Gilets Jaunes in France were a little bit, you know, the, the first time where, you know, people became very aware uh, that this, uh, the issue of climate policy, if you like, you know, was going to be uh, uh, instrumentalized, but that also it was going to have appeal, anti-climate was going to have appeal on, on both sides of the spectrum. But the other thing that I think it's important to say, especially in light of what some of you have said today, is that, you know, it was important to look at it in context, because um, you were talking, Philip, for example, about um, you know, women in, you know, in rural areas, in, you know, in farmland who are, you know, they experience climate change, and yet, on the other hand, you know, they don't seem to be, you know, uh, converted, if you like, to, to, to the, to the, uh, to the policy. And, you know, one of the things we realized was that depending on where you went, um, you needed to talk about climate, or you needed to talk about the environment, or you needed to talk about nature or you needed to talk about air pollution, that in a sense, in order to get into, uh, you know, into how people discussed this, uh, there was a very strong contextual um, element and a very, um, you know, and a set of references and a vocabulary. And one of the things that the Green Deal doesn't do is precisely that, right? It's a kind of one size fits all. In, in many respects, in the way that it was presented. And, you know, and that in communications terms is really not very good. Um, so what we did is we monitored the, the conversation online through Twitter, but also TikTok, Facebook, you know, open Facebook groups, uh, YouTube, Wikipedia, um, you know, anything that we, that we could access. So you know, we've got now a very large uh, set of data. And the, 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 the Base, the basic findings that we have were the following. One is, as Edwin said, 
um, you know, the, con the conversation was very, very institutional and, you know, and very much Brussels talking to itself. So, you know, even when you had climate activists, civil society actors, ordinary people trying to interact in particular with the commission or with the commissioners, um, you know, the, the commission took absolutely no notice. Uh, they, you know, they never entered into, into a dialogue. So the, the, the second finding, which is the more worrying finding, is that with respect to the European Green Deal, but also with respect to the Fit for 55, you know, and, and the, the recovery package, one of the things that we find is that there are lots of detractors who are on the populist side, right, who are uh, basically using, you know, that whole rhetoric of a technocratic elitist project drawn up by disconnected bureaucrats, um, you know, that are plotting against ordinary people. But there is also the dissent that comes from the other side. And that is, you know, potentially something that is very worrying, which is that, you know, the activists and, and, and the groups in civil society who aren't never, who aren't even activists, who are simply, you know, uh, open to discussion and interested in the topic and should be allies are actually not allies, right? And they're, so they're mobilizing, you know, on both sides. This means that the, the path for policymakers is, is very, very narrow. And this is something that, you know, we, we saw uh, for the past year and a half, but, you know, we saw it again during COP26, right? Exactly the same dynamics, dissent from, you know, the, the, the populist right and the populist left, but also dissent, you know, from the people who should be allies. So again, you know, you have to ask, you know, how is this being framed? Uh, you know, for it to be so counter, so counterproductive. But I think that, you know, for us, the main finding, which I wanted to discuss today, and, you know, and, and particularly with respect to Poland, is that not only did we find that there was, you know, this green wedge, you know, splitting the progressive group, but what we also found was that the populists were using this issue um, in in a, in a way that was like a you know like a karate move where you use somebody's strength against them, um, you know we we call it jujitsu politics right. So basically taking over all of the rhetoric of freedom and choice and autonomy that normally belongs you know to the more progressive you know potentially pro climate camp and essentially saying you know. We, the populists, we are the defenders of your freedom. We are the defenders of your choice. And these people on the other side, they're just eco-fascists. They're authoritarians, right? Um, and they are people who are essentially, particularly as they're from Brussels, you know, there are people who have absolutely no idea what you need, but, you know, they have made a decision about what is good for you without even asking for your opinion. And so, you know, in, in this respect, you know, we found this starting to happen, you know, at least a year ago, or even a year and a half ago. And actually, you know, we have found in most countries that this is getting, you know, to be more and more the case. And of course, as somebody here already mentioned, in the aftermath of COVID, right, it's very easy to depict either the EU or national governments as you know, hungry for a kind of, uh, or, or having gotten used to being able to apply restrictions, to apply uh, restrictive, restrictive measures. So the, the COVID um, and, and post-COVID, if we can call it that, um, uh, atmosphere or context has also you know, done something to, to this rhetoric. So this is something that we found you know, absolutely across the board. And then to answer your question, therefore, about what is distinctive about, about Poland, I think one thing that is distinctive about Poland, and a number of you have brought it up in different ways here, is the juxtaposition of both a, a, a demand for intergenerational justice, right? You know, demands coming from 
uh, younger people, but at the same time, that being juxtaposed with the trauma of the of the 1990s. So it's an interesting, um, you know, it, it's a very particular sequence of events because in some ways, Poland was very early out of the gates in terms of taking pro-climate measures and in terms of incorporating them even into, into, the, into the constitution. So you actually have an older generation, which is you know, very much wedded to, to these ideas. And then I think a middle generation that is potentially much, uh, you know, much more um, concerned about its lifestyle and its, and its economic uh, capacity. And then a much, much younger generation that I think is probably split Right. Uh, on the one hand, they don't want to let go uh, of, of what you know uh, has been achieved for them, but on the other, they of course you know demand you know that we take care of the planet that that we're going to leave behind for them. So I think the generational issue, even though we find it elsewhere, right? I think in Poland it's probably more complex because of the the, the dual transition in climate and pollution terms and obviously in economic and political terms that took place um, in, in the 1990s. But aside from that, I mean, you know, every, every country has its specificities, but I think that in some ways, Poland, because of the confluence of, um, of issues, Poland is almost a textbook case, right? Um, climate is being used as an effective wedge you know very much so we see this mobilization we see it in the in the traditional media we see it on social media and we see it in the online conversations um, and it is being couched very much in those terms of sovereignty right and the term of sovereignty here is being used in all sorts of different ways in this debate i mean it's being it, it is the term of the year in some in, in some respects when it comes to to Europe. But but you know obviously you have concentric circles, so you have populists basically saying you know there is your sovereignty as an individual, and then nationalist populist parties saying you know, and then there's the sovereignty of Poland, and then you've got Europeans arguing there is the sovereignty uh, of Europe, including in 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 energy terms. And I think all of these are creating a very particular context. Um, but I think that you know, the juxtaposition of, of the nature of the uh, polarization in, in Poland, you know, um, if I contrast this to, um, to Italy or if I contrast it to France or, or even to uh, the Nordic countries, in these other countries, you've got parties on either side, but it's very fragmented. Um, Poland feels more like a pol you know a polarized setting and in that respect therefore it's easier to use a wedge issue in the way that uh, that the populists uh, that the populists have and of course this is being juxtaposed at the moment it's being used in the context right of the rule of law uh, discussion and so in a way obviously um, uh, Brussels is the double villain. It's a, you know, it can be depicted as a villain in climate terms, and it can be depicted as a villain in terms of the, you know, the the warnings that it's issuing towards Poland. So it's being in that respect, you know, it it, it is therefore very easy, uh, you know, to to instrumentalize that that uh, Brussels discourse. And one of the things that we're seeing and that we've noted over the past two months in our monitoring of the social media um, is that more and more there the even the uh, the opposition camp even those people who are more progressive in civil society are starting to become susceptible you know to this notion that Poland is being needlessly humiliated and needlessly persecuted and so this is something that we have noted that has started over the past couple of months. And that, you know, in that, in that respect, climate and rule of law are kind of being joined together and used uh, and, and used as a joint wedge issue. I'll just finish on saying one thing, which is that um, um, there's, you know, there's much more to say about all of this, but the, one of the things I sit here in Paris, 
Um, you know, the France has the presidency of the European uh, Council as of January. Um, France, on the you know, on the one hand, is expected to take forward some of the uh, at least these, some of the Fit for 55 um, uh, framework uh, and, and package measures. It is also uh, very keen to have an alliance with um, some Central and East European uh, members, in particular, in particular Poland, over the nuclear issue. Uh, so, you know, how awkward uh, Poland can make things for France during the presidency is an, is an open question. Um, if that, that presidency also coincides with a major presidential campaign for Emmanuel Macron. So if they choose to make things awkward, they, they certainly can. Um, and, you know, and that's something that we might want to keep in mind at the, at the uh, European, uh, European level. But I'll, I'll stop here. There's far too much to say and, and hand over to everybody else. Yeah, thank you very much, Catherine, and for for this uh, very rich uh, presentation, uh, and and thank you also for for making a bridge to the two other presentations. We will um, uh, we are looking forward now to hear from from Thomas Jungwirth and Susie Dennison, because uh, we with your uh, with your part we have kind of zoomed out to this wider uh, European debate on on climate change and and again to this. Uh, to the green wedge as a as a, um, a feature of the of the future political conflicts in in Europe, and now we would like to zoom in uh, um, to 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 our neighbor uh, country to uh, to uh, the Czech Republic um, with Thomas Jungwirth, um, who uh, can tell us more about. How all these issues we have discussed uh, for the last uh, for the last uh, um, uh, forty minutes, how they um, play out um, in the Czech Republic, and I, my and I, I have two uh, more detailed questions to you. The one is, to what uh, if you take this green transformation, uh, is it in the Czech Republic like in Poland? A sovereignty issue, or is how is it framed in the in the public discourse? Is it a more in the sovereignty terms, in in economic terms, or social transformation, or terms, uh, or maybe it is not a big issue at all? Uh, so how is 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 the Czech Republic uh, different uh, from Poland in that respect? What, what are the similarities? And also to to build a bridge to to um, what I would like Susie to talk more about in, in the last part, how will uh, the Czech Republic position itself in this debate, which uh, Catherine uh, already alluded to, um, on the implementation of the Fit for 55 uh, package, uh, on the taxonomy, and um, is it a natural partner of France or rather an opponent? Uh, um, um, you know, what are, what are the potential coalition partners for the Czech Republic when it comes to the very important political discussions we will have in the upcoming months? So with that, over to you, Thomas. And maybe just allow me one, uh, one, one remark to our viewers. If anybody wants to ask a question, please, um, use the chat uh, on Facebook, on the ECFR or, or the battery account, and we will then pick up your questions and remarks. Thomas, over to you. Thank you, Piotr. Uh, a very fascinating debate, I must say, and uh, especially the last remarks from Catherine, uh, they really spark interest, and I can perhaps start responding to them directly and then take it from there and I see that there is a lot of topics that we're trying to cover in this one session. I think that's a bit of a challenge, but let, let me try to navigate, right? So first of all, I mean, uh, French presidency of the council, I think, can have uh, all confidence in the Czech uh, Republic supporting its nuclear policy. And of course, I mean, there is no change in that, despite the change in government, which is currently imminent. Um, and this is, uh, if there is something to uh, to rely on in Czech politics, it is that there is going to be a principled support for, for nuclear. And of course, I mean, this also translates uh, to a support for gas uh, as a transitional fuel in the EU taxonomy. So there, I think, I mean, the past presidencies have really been on board. Uh, so Slovenia, uh, France and, and Czechia as well. 
And uh, even though some of us may not like this, I mean, this is the political reality we're faced with. Now, when it comes to the broader social uh, uh, and societal acceptance, if, if you will, I mean, um, really the, the parallel with migration, I think is, is quite pertinent because I have to say exactly two years ago, we just sought it out. Uh, me and my colleague, we published an article, is climate becoming the new migration? And here we go. I mean, two years later, we can see that at that point we advocated for an honest um, political elite led a debate that would admit the transition risk, but at the same time would uh, provide a vision for the future, would really provide leadership. But this had not been the case, at least not in Czechia and probably not in the wider region either. And uh, we can see that in the past months, uh, for a conflux of reasons, I think uh, we could see really um, climate uh, issues and also the energy transition, but all, of course, um, uh, personalized in the European Green Deal agenda, becoming the division or the divisive, this divisive topic in the Czech society. So this is something in which I think uh, Czechia and Poland have a lot to share. Now, the question is, I mean, why is that the case? What are the reasons behind it? So some of them have been already mentioned. Um, I think to a large degree, um, this has also to do with uh, the latest uh, energy crisis and the spike in the prices for households. But in the Czech context, it was also the pre-election debate and simply the lack of leadership, the lack of any progressive political voices that would have um, you know, strong uh, public backing and at the same time would really step behind the European climate agenda, the European Green Deal, the Fit for 55 package. It seems that nobody really wants to take this as an issue of their own, even, even uh, political parties that otherwise uh, would be seen as uh, pro-environmental, or socially progressive. I mean, this is something that uh, appears to be very difficult uh, politically and, and, and nobody seems to have the courage really. So what it ends up with is people pointing uh, to the Green Deal agenda as something of a uh, Brussels-based uh, concept that we do not see identify, well, we don't identify with here in the region, which is of course, I mean, perhaps maximum half true. Uh, because at the same time, I mean, the new targets, climate neutrality 2050, minus 55% 2030, I mean, those are all European Council endorsed targets. So all of the countries, I mean, have been on board. Okay, Poland have played some stronger opposition, let's admit that, but even the Czech government had actually accepted those. But now when it comes down to the real issues, when it comes down to the nitty gritty of the Fit for 55 package, I mean, it seems that suddenly everybody's against. And I have to say that even in debates with economic actors in Czechia, so the industry representatives, I mean, on one hand, and really with one breath, they say that they support the climate ambition. This is so important. And, uh, you know, the climate uh, neutrality is such a fundamental target and we are all on board, uh, yada, yada. And then on the other hand, I mean, they go and, and really bash all of the commission's proposals. And I am sure we can find a lot of problematic points in there. And I, I'm sure we can find a lot of points where we can envisage um, negative social impacts or negative economic impacts or negative impacts on the industry, especially in a country which is so heavily relying on automotive as Czechia is. But at the same time, I mean, this is simply not um, sustainable uh, in terms of the narrative. I think there's a lot of hypocrisy in the current debate and we should be able to, to point that out and to say it. Now, the question is, I mean, of course, how did the general population feel about all of this and, and, and what are the public sentiments? Um, I think, and it has been mentioned, I mean, but let me try to, to say what we, and uh, now I'm actually um, speaking as somebody who is in generally, in general defending this agenda, or I mean, understanding the reasons for the need for the agenda, uh, the, the, the links we're trying to make. So on one hand, the, the issue that really changed and switched the public opinions in Czechia on, on uh, climate issues to a degree was uh, the droughts in the past years and the related uh, forest bark beetle calamity, which uh, really destroyed a lot of the uh, nature as people knew it. So this was something that really got people thinking uh, and, and, and perhaps shifted sentiments to some degree. But from there on, 
um, you know, to make this cognitive link with the impacts of climate change and then with greenhouse gas emissions and then all the way to the emissions emitted by the coal power plant uh, in uh, the neighboring uh, city or even, you know, emissions emitted by my own SUV car or even by, uh, as Edwin said, you know, my transatlantic flight to Florida. Um, this is quite difficult and I think uh, the individual ownership is also lacking and, and we're sorry, we're just finding it very um, uh, very difficult for people to take this sort of an ownership and individual responsibility and at the same time not only for themselves but for the country as such right so there's all of this externalization so it's Brussels it's the commission but then again of course it's the China who, or, or other growing economies who should be um, uh, held responsible regardless of the fact that their emissions per capita are still uh, at 60 percent of ours um, and uh, this is something that we're struggling in the debate. So all of this comes to play. To your questions, Piotr, I think uh, sovereignty, it is an issue, but probably not as emotionally um, charged as in Poland, I would say, uh, at least in my understanding. But what has really been um, the imperative in Czechia and the normative in many of the past years is energy sovereignty. So I don't know if this is really felt in very patriotic terms, but it's just the notion that we have to be able to produce all of the electricity in uh, in our country. It's also to be noted here that Czechia is one of the biggest exporters of electricity for the past decades in Europe. This might change very soon, but I mean, this is the reality still. And of course, I mean, this also omits the fact that we're just importing many and many of the primary energy sources anyways, I mean, from, from oil to gas, um, uh, to nuclear fuel, to our, for our indigenous nuclear power plants. Um, but I think this sovereignty this debate has been very much skewed and has been very prominent in, in the question of the energy transition. And of course, then in the question of, of the sovereign right to its own energy mix as, uh, as established in European law. Um, and I think I'll end here. Uh, I try to go a bit around to from, from the political realities to the public sentiments and back, uh, but I'll be happy to answer any further questions if there are any. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Thomas. And uh, I would like to turn to Susie now, who have heard for one hour and a half <laughs> um, all the very interesting presentations. Uh, but uh, this is the, the reason why we kept Susie for the last <laughs> uh, for the last part of this uh, of this kept her waiting for the last part of this um, of this conversation here is that. We would like to move a little bit from the analysis of the of the public opinion and uh, of the political realities in our EU member states to the EU level and to the to this political reality at the EU level, which is very much marked by a I think um, interesting uh, combination of of uh, political divides and political tensions among the EU member states. This is not not necessarily a very simple pattern of uh, of political conflicts around the uh, green um, green new deal green european green deal this is the correct um, name and uh, susie um, published um, co-authored a, a report earlier this year um, analyzing potential coalitions um, within the european uh, union which could possibly, on the one hand, push the project forward, on the other hand, perhaps uh, try to slow them down, slow, slow it down. And um, in view of, of, um, of the upcoming French presidency and the, the evolving nature of the, of the uh, European uh, debate, I think it would be very interesting to, to hear your views on how those, um, on the one hand, uh, divisions within the EU member states, and on the other hand, divisions among the EU member states, how they play out at the EU level and how do they affect the, the policy making in the, in the European Union? Um, um, and um, how do you also see, especially uh, perhaps uh, countries like Poland or the Czech Republic um, um, in, in, this, in this European struggle, 
uh, to to implement the green deal and what is also the potential of this um, of this project to to flourish in the in the um, under the french presidency but also beyond that so susie uh, please the floor is yours Thank you very much, Piotr. And just to be very clear, um, it hasn't been a burden in any way to, to sit and listen to the other speakers. It's been um, extremely interesting, and I'm, I'm really grateful to um, all the, the comments, um, which will very much kind of, um, uh, I'm very much going to draw on um, in, in what I'll try and say briefly now. Um, and uh, sort of just my, my starting point is that, uh, like everybody else um, on, uh, on, on this panel, um, I'm also a fan of the, the Counterpoint uh, Green Wedge report. And so I'm, I'm very much going to take the sort of division that that sets out as, as a starting point um, and as a given and, and try and sort of say a few words about why this matters at a European level in terms of our ab ability to kind of work on that file. And then a couple of thoughts um, that have been largely spurred by today's conversation um, on um, uh, what, how we might deal with that um, at a European level. So sort of firstly on the why um, the, the division uh, matters. I mean, I think the, the first and most ob obvious point is that um, it's going to massively affect our ability to deliver the Fit for 55 package um, and uh, uh, the other elements um, of the, the European um, Green Deal over the longer term. I think a, a sort of a key reason um, why Europe has been able to come out sort of first with its action plan on how to decarbonize the European economy um, has been precisely the sort of uh, the peer pressure within within the EU to sort of to, to, yeah to, to, to push us um, uh, further than perhaps we're nationally comfortable uh, with committing to. And I think that the, the sort of the division um, at political level um, that we've been talking about today does have um, the potential to our act as a, as a break on that effect over the coming months and years. We did um, another uh, report uh, earlier this year, which was kind of based on a, a survey of policymakers in terms of their thinking on the implementation of, of the Green Deal called Europe's Green Moment. Um, and that showed that this, this kind of this the socio-political um, consequences of the Green Deal are precisely what policymakers are worried about um, uh, when it comes to taking this further. When we ask the question about what, what are the big challenges, 19 out of um, 27 uh, sets of policymakers at a national level put this um, sort of up there first. So we, we know that this is the problem. Um, uh, but sort of looking beyond the, the the implementation of the Green Deal within the EU, I think the second part of the problem is that this is also going to act as a break on our ability um, to uh, to push climate action globally. Um, and uh, you know, as 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 has been sort of laid out many times, as as Europeans, given that we're responsible for under ten percent of um, global emissions. Uh, our, our ability to kind of to deliver the sorts of um, results that we need on the issues that we know citizens are worried about um, comes precisely from uh, our, our, our sort of coalition power uh, more broadly. And um, so this is where the, the kind of the external dimension of the, uh, the Green Deal comes in, um, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, but, but not only that, the sort of the potential of um, partnerships around green tech um, uh, around energy security, around our ability to sort of really broaden that debate um, to include green energies does depend on us um, acting as a block, actually, because in order to shape this discussion, um, we, we need to be, um, we need to be Europe. We can't, there, are, there are very few member states that can sort of have that voice um, on their own. And then I think the sort of the third part of um, the why this matters is Europe's emblematic role, precisely because we have um, taken the decision to go um, to go first and lay out um, our plans in, in, in the Green Deal. Um, I think that there is real potential um, uh, on in the EU um, uh, implementing this and showing that the socio-political consequences can be managed uh, in terms of pushing uh, other uh, global regions, um, other countries, um, uh, to 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 take the to take the socio political risks too, and so I think that's the other kind of part of the danger uh, of these divisions over the coming years um, that uh, uh, that we 
that we don't sort of seize that. Um, so in terms of kind of how, how to manage that, um, I was, uh, I really liked um, uh, Catherine's comments about um, uh, the need for, for jujitsu for jujitsu uh, policy making um, uh, around this area. And I think um, that that is precisely what we need to be doing around um, the climate debate. It seems to me that the kind of, um, a number of problems have been emphasized about the, the shaping of the, um, of the European Green Deal. But I, I would kind of add another one in, which is that um, it, it has in, in a way been kind of sold to the European public as a choice that we're making, something that we're doing um, uh, in order to do the right thing um, on uh, the global climate challenge, rather than being something that actually we have to do. Um, and, we, and we've been um, working uh, at, at TCFR on another project that we're launching uh, later this week called the, the New Power Atlas. And what we've tried to do there is to show how um, dependencies uh, between different global players are shifting as a result of the climate and resource question. And our, our starting point for that is that actually given the global consensus around the need for climate action, albeit a fragile one, the, um, the transition away from carbon is now inevitable. And that has huge consequences um, for Europeans in terms of our energy dependencies, in terms of our, um, our, our tech relationships, um, in terms of um, us essentially kind of having the tools that we will need to, um, to compete in that environment. And so I think um, that, that this is the message um, that, uh, that we need the European institutions, um, but also perhaps more importantly, national governments to be, to be really gripping that it, it's not, we shouldn't be so focused on the risk to European companies of becoming uncompetitive in this environment um, if we do take uh, uh, take the, the steps foreseen under the 50-55 pack, fit for 55 package, sorry. Um, we should be more focused on the risks of inaction uh, for, for European competitiveness because if we don't get in early and um, shape the relationships um, that it, with, with partner supplier countries um, that we're going to need um, in order to um, to fulfill the NDCs that we're setting out at member state levels, then, then actually um, over time, uh, we risk not being able to kind of make as many choices within those relationships about um, where, where we're going to um, get our supplies from of the natural resources that we need and the, um, uh, and, and the tech relationships that we need. Um, and, and I don't think that there are many EU states, um, Thomas, that are in the position of Czechia where there is any potential of guaranteeing our own energy security. And certainly for Europe as a whole, that's not an option. We are going to be dependent um, on, uh, on, on bringing those things um, in from, from outside um, the EU. So I think it's that kind of, um, it's that narrative that, 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 that we need to push forward on um, that uh, we, we actually have to, um, <laughs> to get in early and, and, and try and shape this environment um, in, order to, uh, in order to survive um, in, in, in the new coming um, geopolitical reality. And sort of just sort of coming back to the, the political debate, and I'll, I'll finish on, on that point. I think that a little more kind of realism and honesty around that um, could be quite helpful in terms of the political discussion, because it essentially diffuses the populist argument that our motivation for climate action is kind of part of the big internationalist conspiracy um, uh, to sort of operate on global challenges. And it, it sort of puts the onus more on, um, you know, sovereignty being about um, the ability to make the choices now, while we still can, while we can still um, kind of shape the the the, the, the coming relationships, um, uh, rather than it being about one of choice being taken away from us um, at national level. And I also think, although that isn't the subject of today's conversation, that this could be quite important um, in terms of our international relationships. That it kind of puts us on a more honest footing in the dialogue. Um, uh, with, with, with third countries about why we're doing this, that this isn't about Europe lecturing, this isn't about um, Europe um, uh, sort of uh, simply, that, 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 that we essentially trying to defend our interests in the same way as, as other players are um, in, in, in this environment. Um, and, you know, that is, that is the logic um, that, that we're applying. So, um, so yeah, I think um, those were the sort of the, um, the, the reflections that, that I wanted to feed in. 
Um, but it really seems to me that, uh, that there is a, a deep interconnection between how we handle the national politics and um, how we handle uh, our, our competitiveness in this, um, this shifting environment. Thank you very much, Susie. Thank you very much, Susie. Now uh, we have 18 minutes left. So if anyone, ladies and gentlemen, would like to take the floor and raise any specific issue, just give me a sign by raising your hand or just communicate it to me. Um, and uh, in the meantime, I will ask uh, my next question to Joanna Maćkovic Pandera. After the statements of uh, Tomasz and Susie, I get the impression that uh, it's very interesting to have another look at this link between the image of the European Union that we have and the problems of climate transition. So Susie's talked about it, uh, that uh, the European Union is a body that is capable of really doing something to save the climate and as an organization it is really necessary uh, if we want uh, to do something about solving this task uh, but uh, at the same time throughout our conversation we have heard over and over again that uh, climate policies uh, as Catherine talked about it, Philip, Philip talked about it, uh, that uh, climate can trigger anti-European discussions that lead uh, to people challenging uh, the European Union. And in this context, I'm thinking about uh, two problems uh, I would like to ask you about. So the first one is uh, energy sovereignty. I know that Susie talked about it already, but I'm really interested in your opinion, uh, as you are the, the expert in the field of energy. What is energy sovereignty? And is it something we should strive for as member states of the European Union? And the second problem are the costs, costs of energy transition. It is very often said that uh, the European Union is to blame uh, because due to the Green New Deal, the Green Deal due um, uh, to different actions of the European Union, the energy costs are rising. So what is your take on these two problems? Um, well, let me begin by expressing my gratitude for being able to take part in this discussion because I have had so many interesting points. And now about uh, energy sovereignty. What we are struggling with uh, is uh, certain phrasing being repeated over and over again without being rooted in reality. Maybe 20 years ago, energy um, sovereignty dependent on having direct access to resources uh, and for this reason indeed back then Poland was one of the most sovereign countries in Europe uh, in terms of energy but it started to change and it is incredible for me to see that we haven't noticed these changes. Our dependence on uh, supply of energy from other sources has in increased uh, by 60% in recent years. Uh, uh, we haven't noticed increased importation of hard coal. We haven't noticed uh, that we don't have enough of this research in Poland yet. We haven't noticed the increasing diversification of energy sources, uh, more and more gas in the energy mix. Um, so we also import more and more electric power. Well, at this point we are expecting exporting more, but this balance is changing. So can we really talk about sovereignty anymore in the old sense? The possibility of 
importing energy from other countries is not negative in itself because it reduces the cost of energy transition for our country. So as long as we have a choice and as long as we are not too restricted by that, it is positive. So sovereignty, independence, I don't know exactly which we are talking about, but one thing is clear. If we uh, don't undergo transition towards more renewable energy sources, our dependence on our country, on other countries will increase more and more because we will have to uh, import gas and, uh, and oil. And maybe let me add to that discussion nuclear power. I don't want to discuss about it because maybe indeed it is it is necessary. But in the debate, it is being said that it is a part of our energy security. And from my perspective, it's hard to think uh, of a project that would be more tied uh, to the wishes and will of a single company really a single uh, provider uh, so um, we are talking about electrification in modern sense we are talking about renewable sources so in this context energy security means the possibility to obtain energy from reliable sources so the entire europe is afraid of a possible blackout and of CO2 emissions. And of course, in that context, we have to continue discussing about energy security, but in mobile global sense. And now about costs. Well, this discussion is really complex because the losses of mining reached the level of more than 2 billion zloty. So hardly anyone talks about the fact that we lose a lot of money on that. We the supporting the mining industry costs us up to 5 billion zloty a year and it is not really an investment that is fit for the future and we tend to forget that our mining sector is aging and we have to we are forced to invest in new sources 70 percent of our power plants are older than 70 years so i really liked listening to uh, susie who said uh, that uh, People want us to believe that it is our choice whether we want to transition away from carbon or, or not, as if it was really a choice, as if we were standing at a crossroad and could take this path or that path. This is not the case. There is no going back to coal. And uh, we are not even talking about it, that the banking sector is determined uh, to get rid of too many clients from the coal sector. So it is not only about climate. It is about companies who very soon will have to disclose their carbon footprint. OK, I don't want to say that we don't have any choice at all, because in Poland um, there is always a lot of resistance if we say there is no choice. But the question is, what choice is it? What can we really do? And I think we have to, we are forced to transition away from coal towards renewable energies and also towards gas to a certain extent in order to find the balance in the process of transitioning away from coal. And also one word of comment, because I was really inspired by what Catherine said when she said uh, that the green, the wet, this wedge is a splitting progressive groups as well. Uh, so uh, there are these proposals for new system, this non-ETS uh, uh, to include buildings and transport in the system of emissions. And there are a lot of debates and a lot of divisions in the European Union. And I'm asking myself, what happened uh, with the polluter pays principle. So if someone pollutes, they should be forced to pay. If there is no clear signals that, um, that the pollution of the environment uh, leads to very concrete, very specific costs, it will always um, be more economical to keep polluting. And uh, 
there are arguments between different progressive organizations and all that is underpinned by deep fear that we won't be able to cope with it, that it will kill us. Of course, there are certain risks, but we must not forget the substance, the fact that we need to reduce emissions from buildings, uh, from transport, not only for the sake of climate in general, but also for the sake of air pollution. So maybe that will be all from me. Thank you very much, Joanna. We have uh, a few more minutes, uh, so I would like to come back to Tomasz. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the European dimension we talked about? Because at the very end, I would like to uh, give Edwin the floor, uh, unless uh, Katrin or if he would like to say a word of comment as well. But in your statement, you mentioned the discussion about the trade in emissions and reforming the EDS system as one of the more controversial problems in your country. So to have a full picture of this political debate uh, we have today, it would be interesting for me to know where did you identify the Mo the areas which are most controversial, disputable, which may be uh, split to uh, member states, which be decisive in uh, the future division of powers. We mentioned the taxonomy in the future. So uh, what will be essential in the decision which energy sources will be funded and supported by the European Union apart from green sources, uh, nuclear power, and gas will also be recommended by the European Commission as um, sort of transitional uh, energy sources. So do you think this debate is the one that is having the highest political potential or are there any other threats in the discussion that are uh, also essential? So what from, what is the map of the current po political divisions in Europe as we are trying to implement the European Green Deal? Well, I mean, I can answer it from the Czech perspective and then try to give it a bit of a European twist as well. I think, I mean, from discussions with colleagues, it's quite clear that in Czechia, and I mean, from the media discourse, really, and the political discourse, the biggest singular divisive um, hit was uh, the proposal for the ban of, uh, of uh, combustion engines by 2035. Uh, the sales of those engines, to be precise, uh, because in Czechia, of course, uh, automotive industry is such a politically and economically charged issue that uh, this has really been the singular uh, event uh, that had sparked so much opposition. But then uh, really debating those issues with colleagues across Europe, it seems that uh, each country really has a, an issue or a topic of its own. And there seems to be very limited convergence, I feel, in terms of what is it that sparks the debate, because there is simply so much in the package, there is so much in the climate agenda, so each country can find its own. Of course, I mean, for many, it is the question of, uh, of uh, public funding for gas projects. I mean, this can be a political charge issue as well. Of course, the energy markets, and especially then also the ETS, market, I mean, is something that is felt quite strongly, especially then in the context of, uh, of the energy crisis and the rising prices of, of household uh, electricity and heat, linked as they might be or may not be to the ETS price. But this is something that, of course, is in many people's minds. So I feel that uh, really this differs from country to, to country. But I mean, from the Czech case, the situation has been clear. And uh, uh, we have actually been talking to some officials in the commission and saying, if you want to increase the potential for acceptance of the whole package in Czechia, I mean, scrap this idea for uh, the uh, normative ban on, on uh, uh, combustion engine sales, uh, because you might actually achieve the same results with uh, different measures, market-based, uh, et cetera, uh, or, uh, you know, um, other normatives. But this simple, simple thing, this one thing really made the headlines and, and really mobilized a lot of uh, anti-European sentiment as well. So then, of course, it translates into an anti-European agenda, which is something that we are all fearing. Uh, so let's see, I mean, if this is possible, let's see if the damage can be somehow mitigated. 
And uh, uh, yes, as I said, I mean, in other European countries, I'm sure this is, you know, a, a, a debate on, on different topics with a different political charge based on what is also the, the political agenda domestically. So, for instance, in France, I mean, apparently the big political issue for the upcoming six months, or at least the upcoming three months, I mean, is, uh, is, is getting CBAM through. And uh, this seems to be the number one priority. I have to say that, uh, sadly, uh, given the, the state of preparations of the Czech presidency from uh, July onwards, I mean, it seems to, to, to be the case that we don't even know what are the national priorities in terms of uh, getting the agenda forward. And uh, I have to say also that, uh, that uh, simply uh, the capacities in the public administration and the funding for the presidency are lacking. So we are quite fearful of what is actually coming up and would be hopeful for the French presidency to move things as forward as possible. But uh, then again, we have to be realistic in what can be expected. So um, let's see if uh, the new government steps into the role of the honest broker. I think this is really an interesting part to, to observe uh, or whether the national priorities are always you know, resurfacing because uh, I would be very much hoping that uh, with the new government and actually a very promising name for the Minister for European Union or European Affairs, um, uh, we Czechia might finally step back in uh, pushing its domestic agenda um, and, and it's, uh, of course, domestic political narratives uh, contrary to the Fit for 55 package and become something of, a, uh, of an independent uh, or, or at least, uh, you know, a reasonably engaged facilitator. Thank you, Tomas. We are coming to the end of our debate. We've covered a wide range, a very wide range of topics. But that, that was the idea for, for this debate. We wanted to demonstrate that there are many topics which are related to the idea of the green transition. These are not just national issues. These are also European issues, and we also have uh, problems with the democracy and the future of our political systems. Uh, and now voice over to Edwin. He can make a, a very brief conclusion. I think it's very difficult to summarize what we've been discussing in just a few words, but maybe you could um, give us a deliver a few remarks towards the end. So first of all, thank you a lot for this great conversation. We've covered a wide range of topics and that shows how complex the problem is, the macro level and the micro level and the, com the individual complexity of everyone, because sometimes we start understanding that we don't even know ourselves and we ourselves make surprising choices when there is an election for example and that was demonstrated in that research project that Filip Pazderski talked about but the green transition it is something that must be done and we understand that and it is also the case in Poland because in Poland in our history we had a system that collapsed the energy system collapsed and then the political system had to go too and the energy system or the situation in in the energy sector was worsening more and more and that in turn led to the collapse of the economic uh, system and the political system as such. So the e energy sector in Poland understands that. However, I'm afraid, and that's the last issue I want to refer to, I'm afraid that there might be another scenario, and it is the one that we are referring to in our negotiations with the European Union right now. So whatever our government um, do now, um, there is this question whether we want to leave the European Union and then the Polish government always uh, say, no, we don't want to leave the European Union. We just want to um, follow the treaties the way we understand them. So actually uh, we 
maybe destroying the European Union from within the European Union. And the same could apply to the green transition. So we might not be saying that we don't like the green transition. We might be saying that we very much welcome the green transition. However, we need to be slower. We need it to be adjusted to our national needs. So we could be actually destroying the green transition from within the European Union, not as an open opponent of the green transition. Uh, on the contrary, we'll be very much in favor of, of it, but we'll be demanding that it should be slower or it should be adjusted to our individual national needs. And now my very last sentence, we also have an important lesson to learn and that is the pandemic. So the current government, they want to be authoritarian, they want to have the full power in Poland. However, it is also the weakest government we've had in the last 30 years, because these people are not able to do anything to protect our security um, in this pandemic situation, because the politics of, of our government, well, it's just an opportunistic behavior, and they are very afraid of losing the supporters within the society, and they are afraid of taking um, decisive steps to um, combat the pandemic. So that's a threat I, I can see. We might actually enter the process of the green transition, but we will actually hinder it. We will stop it from moving fast enough, and this could be a real, real danger coming from the Polish side. So, so much to conclude uh, the debate. Thank you a lot for this great discussion we've had today. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you. And I think that this last remark um, by Edwin was quite pessimistic, but I think that all the institutions, all the organizations that we represent here have a common goal. They want to prevent this pessimistic scenario from actually taking place. So we'll be driven by this goal in the months to come, and we will do whatever is possible um, so that a better scenario is actually uh, the one that will be taking place. Have a nice evening. Thank you for being with us, and see you soon.